Welcome on into the Wolverine.com podcast. Clayton Safey alongside Chris Ballas and Anthony Broom, the birthday boy, Anthony Broom. Happy birthday. Uh, celebrating here on the podcast today. We'll preview Michigan football against Nebraska. Hard to believe it is already the 10th game of the regular season. Um, pretty crazy. So take a mental picture this weekend, folks, especially if you're going to the big house, uh, you know, running out of time here in this season. But uh, it's been a fun one so far. Michigan number three in the college football playoff rankings, Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan, and then TCU, those top four. Uh, let's start with that, guys. Chris, you wrote a column earlier in the week kind of breaking down how Michigan can get in. Basically, option number one is not the easy way, but the the way you can guarantee it is if you take care of business against Nebraska, beat Illinois on senior day, and then beat the Buckeyes in, in Columbus. Easier said than done, but – you know, you're 12-0, and 0, you, uh, you know, will be a favorite in the Big Ten Championship game. You go that route. But if you lose close to Ohio State, there's still a chance there. Um, what do you guys – there's so many pieces that have to play out around the country, but what are you guys thinking right now in terms of Michigan's chances? Yeah, that's what people don't understand, right? When it, it, the first college – football playoff rankings are released, they're like, well, clearly the committee is saying that Michigan needs to beat Ohio State. Well, that's assuming that everything else goes according to plan, right? And that's just not the way it works. Uh, in fact, it almost never works that way. And then if, and if anything, this is going to be the year, guys, I'm, I'm convinced of it, that there's going to be chaos because you're almost guaranteed, right, that Michigan and Ohio State are going to have one loss. You look at Clemson, which is, you know, a, a horrible loser to a, a bad Notre Dame team or at least an average Notre Dame team. And they're kind of out of it. Alabama's out of it. So there are and you've got three Pac-10, Pac-12 teams with one loss. And you know what? There is a legit chance that all three of them will have two losses by the end of the year. So are you going to take a two loss champion over a one loss Michigan team that, you know, maybe barely loses to in Columbus or to an Ohio State team that, you know, say maybe barely loses at home? Um, I don't know. What do you do about that? And if you do, you're going to hear some squawking, guys. How much weight is on that championship versus, you know what, they've got one loss, you know, compared to two. Uh you know what, to me, I get it, but championships are weighed differently in different conferences. So I understand the importance of a championship, but if you've got two, they always say they're looking for the four best teams, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see, let's see what happens. But uh, of course, the best, the best way to do it for Michigan is to go down to Columbus and win. And I think they've got a legit chance to do that. I don't think there's any question about it. Uh, they should have in 2016, they got a bad whistle, some bad breaks, made some of their own bad breaks, but this team is designed to run the ball, to exploit Ohio State's weaknesses. Ohio State is not a great defensive team. They look a lot, very similar, Anthony, to what they looked like last year, in my opinion. So I say, hey, I vote for going that route. Yeah, when you look at Ohio State, I mean, they there's a little bit more of an edge to their defense this year. I don't know that they're, they're, they'll fold like they did last year, but outside of those edge guys who are coming on, I don't, you know, this is a, when we talk about, because that's the conversation the next three weeks. I mean, obviously for Michigan, we're going to talk about this game Saturday. We'll talk about the Illinois game, but now it's, it's the buildup to that game against Ohio state, which is a, you know, I know an expanded playoff is coming, but that's basically an extended playoff or an expanded playoff game. That's a play in game. So yeah, to me, I think the message is still pretty clear. Like all things being equal. I think that Ohio, a one loss Ohio state probably has a better chance at getting in than a one loss Michigan was just because of that, the non-conference schedule, but you're right. There's so much that can happen around there. And you know, when we talk about these uh, SEC schools, I kind of feel like there's a backdoor way for maybe them to slide LSU in there as a two loss team. Now that they've beaten Alabama and, and look like they're in the driver's seat in the West, but um, you know, they could have a letdown situation here. I mean, TCU, I know they've talked about game control, but at some point you just have to reward teams for winning the games on their schedule. I think they have, four top 25 wins. So they belong. I feel like this week with where we're at right now, they got the rankings correct for this week. Uh, put up, you know, I know Joe Klatt said something about, uh, you know, Ohio Michigan should be over Ohio state. That's that's split hairs at this point. Those two are two a and two B they're going to play with the right to kind of, you know, solidify their own destiny. But yeah, like you said before, I mean, there, there are certainly things, there are scenarios in play where you could slide in with one loss, but I don't know. Like you don't, you don't want to be the team that has to wait for help. So right. win your way in. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the message. That's been the the mo throughout the season, and we'll see what happens from there. But to me, yeah, it's uh, 
people have talked about a lot about how this expanded playoff is going to devalue the regular season. When you look at a year like this year, how everything's played out, there's only more value to all of these mm-hmm. games and having it sorted out on the field, especially when it comes down to seating, when it comes to those, you know, you'll have home field games on the line when that happens. So I know we let's talk and playoff a couple of years from now, but uh, yeah, right now, long and the short of it is committee got it right on Tuesday and the data that they get from how these games play out will inform what happens next. Real quick, Clay, it is amazing how often I agree with you. I'm nodding my head. Yeah, that's exactly the, what I'm thinking. Uh, you you are doing a great job at the Wolverine.com because you agree with me. Uh, number one. Number two, TCU, I think that's going to take care of itself. I think they lose at, at Texas this week. Uh, the only thing that I would say about the Ohio State argument is that I think the committee will look at that. Okay, you've got a home game now. Um you haven't beaten – there's not a top 25 team on your schedule. You've beaten one top 25 team just like Michigan, right, Penn State, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, maybe Notre Dame is now. Notre Dame, they're number yeah, two. They, yeah, they've moved up. Yep, so uh, – and they could just as easily move down again. So uh, – but I think they would look at that and say, you had them at home, you controlled your destiny, you didn't get it done. Whereas Michigan going on the road in that environment, I think they would weigh that a little bit more heavily, but that's just me. And we'll find out, right? Yeah, yep. they kind of each have a different data point because Michigan has the weaker schedule – Mm -hmm. You know, if they were to lose in that game's on the road, but Ohio State, like you said, it's at home. I already see the ESPN talking heads already kind of laying the groundwork for LSU sneaking in with two losses. I mean, gee, why would they do that? Right, exactly. (laughs) And especially now that that the Big Ten is done with ESPN starting with next season. Um, So you're seeing that. But yeah, there's so many different scenarios in the TCU game we will talk about at the end when we get to our picks. We got some good games this weekend again. But yeah, you're right. I mean, Things are going to change on the weekly. We saw that last week where people were concerned. And it was a little surprising, I thought, in my mind, that Clemson was ahead of Michigan. We saw why on Saturday, but uh, it kind of worked itself out there. Um, Moving more towards this game, looking at Michigan, a banged-up Michigan team again. They were getting healthier and healthier. uh, And then they have about five, six guys that don't make the trip to Rutgers last week. Another guy in Trevor Keegan at left guard go down during that game. Um, Harbaugh said after the game, Ryan Hayes and Roman Wilson should be back this coming week. Don't know anything, uh, you know, that's been on the record about Jalen Harrell or Makari Page. Um, Blake Corm is a guy who I feel like you want to rest up a little bit here down down the stretch before you play uh, at least Ohio State, but, you know, potentially Illinois as well, depending on how that game's going. So, uh, you know, I guess what are you guys expecting from Michigan in terms of who they field this weekend and, you know, what it kind of looks like? Yeah, I think Trente Jones will be back. I think Carson Barnhart can slide in there. It's going to be interesting to see who plays over if Gio Ohadi, Gio Ohadi and Carson Barnhart, yeah. because Gio Ohadi has been playing outstanding football, man. These younger linemen are really, you're looking like, this is looking, you guys, this is before your time, but the 1990s, you could plug guys in there and they wouldn't miss a beat. And that's exactly what this is looking like. Gio Ohadi is one of the better sophomores I've ever seen on the Michigan offensive line at this point in his career. And I think that's saying something. So uh, I like that kid a lot. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Um, I think Keegan's out for sure. So uh, nice getting Hayes back. Roman Wilson wasn't banged up at all. So uh, Paige and Harrell, I think you keep them out this game, guys, if there's any doubt. I think you rest them for another week. Anybody that you can, because this Nebraska team without its quarterback now, as we just found out, uh, is terrible. You got to stop the run. You do that with your guys up front. Those guys are going to be there. Taylor Upshaw really had a nice game in hindsight Mm -hmm. against Rutgers. So you can slide him in there for Harrell, uh, especially against the run, and get the job done there. So this is a bad football team. And it's unfortunate because I was looking at this game before the year and thinking, hey, maybe this will be one of those that bolsters the schedule a little bit. Not so much. So I expect Michigan to dominate on both sides of the ball. I was just looking at this game ahead of the year as another chance to stuff Scott Frost in a locker, but that Bomber. doesn't really happen either. But yeah, yeah, you know, when we talk about the offensive line, one of the upsides of having some guys out is that, you know, you're seeing young guys like Gio Elhadi get in there. Uh, Jeff Percy, I thought, played really well last week at left tackle. You're starting, like, you're building equity you know, it, they're injury replacements for now, but you're also building equity for next year. You know, if those guys are in the starting lineup, they'll have seen game reps. They'll have seen live bullets, so to speak. So again, you want to, I think right now the objective is we want our dominant offensive line to be as healthy and as, a, as fresh as it possibly can be going into that game against Ohio state. I mean, this is a, the last week is an opportunity to sit out a lot of guys because of the opponent that you played. And this is another week where, 
Uh, I actually think did did Rutgers beat Nebraska or whatever it was? They were in a close game. That it doesn't matter. They both stink. Nebraska so. won by one. Yeah, I that was the game I had Nebraska to cover in, and they didn't they didn't cover That's three right. points. So. That's right. I think that was the weekend we were in uh, Iowa City, maybe Indiana. Yep. Indiana. Okay, but uh, yeah. So the injured guys. I mean, I'm I'm with you, Chris. I mean, you anyone that can play. I mean, by all means, get your reps, get in there. If you've been out for a bit, knock the rust off. But if there's any question about Maybe they could play, maybe not. Just it's good to go for at least another week because it's all hands on deck from here. You need as many healthy bodies as you can get and and as many reinforcements as you can get ahead of that game that last weekend in November. So, yeah, roll with the guys you got and see what, you know, those guys are capable in backup roles. So, Yeah, I think the most interesting thing to watch will be right tackle, left guard. Like you said, Chris, you know, with do you go with El Hadi or – you know, or is Carson Barnhart, do you want to just keep rolling with him at right tackle or what decisions they're going to make there um, will be interesting. Rest of the Michigan offense playing, you know, a, a defense that has been solid actually over the last few games. Uh, they actually were pretty good against Minnesota, especially in the first half, shutting them out, but allow 20 unanswered points. They lose 20 to 13 after having a 10, nothing halftime lead. Um, you know, they're not very good against the run. They're not very good against the pass, but I think Michigan will be able to use its formula that it has been. Uh, we did see them take some downfield shots last week, try to get that going, tried some different guys at receiver. I thought that was interesting. Amori and Walker, we saw him. We saw Tyler Morris pick up a big third and eight. Um, so they're they're tinkering there. Also, Roman Wilson was out, so there's obviously that uh, plays a factor in, in terms of that rotation. But um, what do you guys see out of the Michigan offense in this game against the Nebraska defense without starting safety? Miles Farmer, who uh, is one of their best defensive players overall. He had a DUI on Saturday. So it's just been a rough season for Nebraska overall. Yeah, more of the same. I agree with you. And more of the same doesn't mean run, 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 run. They came out against both Indiana and Rutgers with some play action guys and uh, kept them off balance. That's a way to get a team off balance right there. When you show your quarterback with the NFL arm rolls out and throws for 35 yards, you know what? Uh, then you're like, okay, well, now what do we do? <laughs> you know. So I, I have a good feeling that you're going to see uh, more of that. You're going to see some more shots, and I think eventually they're going to connect. Somebody made a good point. Jake Rudock wasn't connecting on those deep balls until, what, November, his first year? Yeah, that Indiana mistaken. game. Right, and yeah. uh, sometimes it takes a while. Uh, Wilton Spate had some nice ones uh, a few years after that. But um, you know what? Shea Patterson missed a ton of them, and it's it's a tough pass. It really is. Cade McNamara was better at it, flat out, and I know that's going to rankle some ruffle some feathers, whatever, but flat out, he was better at it. And, uh, and JJ McCarthy can be, and I think he will be good at it. I don't think there's any question about it. They're just missing. It's not like he's overthrowing these guys by five yards. So, and, and yes, Andrew Anthony did get his hands on that one, but as Matt Weiss said, the quarterback's coach, it was too far inside and you know what, it should have been here or a little short if anything, when you're that wide open. So, but I think you're going to see Blake Corum a lot that you're still going to see 20 something carries from him. He is a Heisman candidate, and I think they'd like to see him in New York. You know what? This is not a, an individual award program, but uh, if you can get your guy to New York on, you know, in December, I think that's a, a great opportunity for him. So you'll see a lot of Donovan Warren or Donovan Edwards too. Yeah, Donovan Warren, Donovan Edwards too. But uh, I think you're still going to see plenty of quorum, and I think they're going to run the ball just fine. Yeah, I see more of the same. Uh, it, they need to start hitting on more of those deep passes, like you said. I, I do think it was – was very interesting to see the freshmen as early in that Rutgers game as we did uh, and in critical situations too. I think that's, listen, Ronnie Bell has been reliable. Uh, Cornelius Johnson, you know, has been up and down, mostly down. I don't think either of those guys or anyone that's been on the field has played well enough to warrant. Well, we just have to have Cornelius Johnson on the field at all times or Ronnie Bell on the field at all times. I'd like, you know, if, I think it's a great sign those young guys are coming along, especially, you know, when you look at an Amorian Walker and Darius Clemens, who we didn't see till we didn't see Clemens until later in that game. But, you know, part of the reason that I feel like they've missed on a lot of these deep balls is that uh, guys have either been alligator arming it or just aren't those, those 50, 50 ball threats down the field. I think we talked about that a couple, a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, Walker is six, three, six, four Clemens, I think is six, two, six, three, something like that. So I would like to see those guys get more involved. Uh, you know, Michigan just, they just haven't, they haven't hit on as many of those this year. I think they're on pace for about four or five less than they hit last year. And, you know, depending on the game, one of those can change or break an entire game open. So 
I think that that is, it sounds like that's been a point of emphasis this week in practice. I think with uh, Nebraska having, you know, the, the issues in the secondary and that safety being out, I think the opportunity will be there to take a few more of those shots. And it would, it would just be great for them to hit at least just one and see if they can snowball from there. So I think that's the biggest thing. Other than that, I think we, you know, this is very much a what you see is what you get meat and potatoes, Michigan offense. And I don't see, I haven't seen anyone slow it down this year, really. I mean, in the red zone, sure. But I certainly don't think a Nebraska team that you know, lost to a one win Northwestern team uh, over on foreign soil is, is going to be a team that uh, gets it done. No. And real quick, I, I, you know, I think it's 15 to 20 carries, probably maybe 20, 21 carries for Corum. He's not going to get as much of the load. And you're going to see a lot of Edwards in there, but uh, he'll still get his share of carries. That's what I meant. For sure. Yeah. 20 last week, Donovan mm-hmm. had 15 carries, but three catches. So they're getting the ball in yep. his hands a lot. And that's something I was going to say is I feel like this is the time of year too, where you start and we saw it in the Maryland game a season ago, right before Ohio state where, okay, now we're doing this. Now we're throwing swing passes to Donovan Edwards. Now we're bringing AJ Henning in motion, things like that, where uh, you can do things off of that. And that, you know, you're putting on film for Ohio state to study um, because as Harbaugh said on Monday during his radio show, I mean, all focus is on Nebraska. Next week, it'll all be on Illinois. But they understand how many days are, are there. It was 18 at the time. And and he was talking about, you know, how all their goals are right there. Our time is now, uh, is what he said. Um, so that's definitely in the back of their mind as well. Flipping to the other side of the ball, uh, this is the fun stuff. Nebraska, uh, Casey Thompson, their quarterback, who led the Big 12 in passing touchdowns last season at Texas, uh, is not going to play in this game. Sean Callahan from Husker Online, who I talked to, believes that Logan Smothers is going to start, and he's a guy, this is his first career start. Uh, if that's the case, he came in after, uh, you know, Chubba Purdy last week really struggled. He was 6 for 11 for 81 yards. Uh, Purdy has, on the season is 16 for 36 for 91 yards, three interceptions. One of them came last week in that really uh, struggle of a game for their offense. So, this is a Michigan defense that has really just been dominant, uh, you know, throughout the Big Ten season, really after that Maryland game, but really for the whole season. Um, team that's number one in the country in rushing defense. It's it's the same formula of getting them in third and longs, pinning your ears back against these young quarterbacks who don't have much experience. Uh, they do have a decent run game with Anthony Grant at the running back spot. Um, but again, Michigan's just been so good at, at shutting down. It doesn't matter. We talk about Penn State's running backs. Michigan shut them down. Uh, Michigan State has some talent at running back, but they got nothing going on the ground as well. Um, so I think it's going to be really tough sledding. Uh, we'll get to our picks. I, I picked Nebraska to score 14 points before Casey Thompson was officially ruled out. But, man, I think that would almost be a win from that Nebraska offense. Things can can go their way. I mean, we saw the block punt, but uh, I think it's going to be tough sledding. Yeah, and Chubba Purdy and Logan Smithers, I saw, you know what, one sounds like a member of the Fat Boys, and the other one sounds like a, a Simpsons character, and I know Anthony will get the Fat Boys reference, that's before your time, Clayton, but Anthony's an old soul, and it's whatever, man, it, I think it's hilarious, I think it's great, but uh, I don't see either one of them doing anything, uh, you know what, and one of the, some of the keys to the game that we wrote about today, number one, obviously, the, the jump balls, right, because the last two weeks we've seen the ball, you know, they throw it up for grabs and they get big plays and, and they lead to scores. Michigan State did it with Keon Coleman and uh, and who was the kid from Rutgers? Uh, Sean. Uh, Sean Ryan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so if you have a big receiver out there who can make a play, uh, you know what, take a shot. And uh, DJ Turner and Jamon Green were both kind of exposed in that area. And I wouldn't say exposed, but they both – didn't play the ball the way they should have. Let's put it that way. So uh, I would watch for that. And then Anthony Grant is a good back, but this is not the kind of back that's going to beat them guys. It's going to be a Kenneth Walker type, a quick guy, a shifty guy. Uh, this guy's kind of a bowling ball from what I've seen. So um, it's going to be interesting to to see if they can run the ball at all. And if they can't, then they're, they're screwed. I don't see them scoring more than 10. I had Michigan 38 to 10. Yeah, I think we're all kind of in that same boat. Somehow I have Nebraska getting to 14. I have 38 14. Uh, spoiler alert when we do pr- uh, predictions here. But yeah, I just, especially with Casey Thompson out, I just don't see it's another week where a team's best shot at sticking around in a football game is for the you know what to hit the fan for a block punt or a turnover or, or what have you. Some of the things that we saw, you know, in the first half of the Indiana game or the Rutgers game. And, when you get into a game like that, you have to be able to keep, you know, 
keep the intensity up. And these, these lesser teams have not been able to do that. And Michigan tends to find it, find itself. It almost feels like the, the best thing that's happened to this team at any point this season is when they get to go to the locker room for halftime. I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. And like I said, it's, uh, you know, we're going to see some probably guys still out from injuries, but this is a, this is a deep football team in a lot of areas too. And, and I think they know there's an awareness with them that they are kind of on the war path now. So a home game against a really bad football team. There's yeah. Is there a path for Nebraska to make it be competitive? Uh, sure. There isn't every, every football game you play, but I don't see it with this opponent this week. I'll tell you that much. And if they are going to throw those deep balls up, like you were mentioning, Chris, if these quarterbacks can get a deep throw off Trey Parker is a good receiver, five touchdowns, all five touchdowns came on deep passes. Uh, he's third in the big 10 in receiving yards, the LSU transfer. So He's a guy, but again, it's like how much of a difference is that going to make when you have quarterbacks who are going to get harassed? They are allowing a ton of pressure. Their tackles, according to Sean Callahan from Husker Online, are their weakness. And teams that have had that, I mean, you look at Iowa, the way Michigan got to them late, Indiana with some bad tackle play. Uh, they just they just abuse those guys. Mike Morris has been really good at finding that weak link. And as the game goes on, setting up an, another move and, and getting there, a couple times. So I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be tough there for Nebraska. We've kind of talked about our picks a little bit, but we'll get to them here in just a moment. Before we do though, let's talk about prize picks. Our great sponsor football is in full swing. There isn't a better way to enjoy your favorite team than by playing daily fantasy with our friends at prize picks. Prize picks is the simplest form of real money, daily fantasy sports and just pits you against the numbers. Whether you're a fantasy sports nut or a casual fan looking to add some excitement to the games, Prize Picks is the perfect game for you. It is the best way to have action on the game in states like Michigan, Kentucky, Alabama, Florida, Texas, Georgia, and over 70% of the United States. Prize Picks is currently operational in over 30 states and Canada, not Ontario. Uh, you simply select two to five players and predict if they will go more or less than their Prize Picks projection. You can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. Uh, this week, I have. Jared Goff, more than 235 and a half passing yards uh, against the Chicago Bears. Maybe a little two two game win streak there for the Lions. And then Josh <laughs> Allen, uh, who may play but be banged up. Uh, under I have him less than 270 and a half passing yards against Minnesota. Hutch, our producer, has Cordero Patterson for the Falcons, more than 62 and a half rushing and receiving yards against the Panthers. That's tonight. And then George Kittle, uh, San Francisco tight end, more than 45 and a half receiving yards that game, uh, the Chargers on Sunday night. What do you guys have this week? Uh, I've got Goff going less than whatever that was against the uh, against the Bears. I think he stinks. I think the Lions stink, and I think they'll be exposed again. Um, and then what was yeah. the other one? I Well, they've won two games all year. They're, they're on a win streak. <laughs> I don't think one is a win streak. I think you have to get to two to make it a win streak. So, um, and then uh, I think it was Aaron Rodgers again. A.A. Ron, I've got him going less than the, I think it's 230.5 uh, against Dallas. 240.5. Yeah, he's not going to get there. His receivers are terrible. The, the Packers are terrible. You hate to see it, as Clay always says. You do hate to see that. You yeah. do hate to see that, yeah. But more than that. You love to see it. Exactly. There you go. There it is. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going with a, a three. I'm going with a three pick this week. So uh, three quarterbacks from across college football. I'm going Caleb, uh, Caleb Williams of USC, more than 305.5 passing yards against Colorado. That's a Friday night game. Uh, Quinn Ewers, more than 260.5 passing yards Saturday night in the aforementioned Texas TCU game. And then Bo Nix, uh, another Saturday night game against Washington. A lot of points going to be scored in that one. I have him at more than 280.5 passing yards. So all quarterbacks, all passing yards, all more this week. I'm a little worried about that Colorado pick just because I don't think he's going to be playing too much uh, in the second half. They're that bad, Colorado. The way just they saying. play the ball, he could throw yep. for 300 yards in the quarter, though. That's a great point. <laughs> Download the Prize Picks app or visit prizepicks.com. Sign up using the code Wolverine to get an instant 100% bonus up to $100 on your first deposit. 
So if you deposit $100, prize picks will give you $100. If you deposit $50, prize picks will give you $50. Don't forget that's the prize picks app or prizepicks.com and the code Wolverine to claim your bonus today and take the viewing of your team to the next level this season. Uh, feel free to hit us up on social media as well. Talk about your picks. Uh, more than happy to do that. Heard we had a good week with people signing up last week as well, Anthony. I believe uh, uh, a record number. So uh, go ahead and we'd love to discuss those. Always watching all the games. So uh, let's talk about this Michigan game. Uh, as of this morning when I looked, Wolverine's 30 and a half point favorites over under 48 and a half. And as Chris, you dropped on the message board this morning, uh, apparently this is the biggest underdog Nebraska's ever been in a game, which isn't overly surprising. That's a, a program that's been good over the years. And 30 and a half is just nuts, but it feels Nebraska, about right. yeah. Nebraska. It's crazy. And, and Mr. Callahan is the one that told us that, okay. uh, by the way, for the Nebraska fans, uh, Sean Callahan and those guys at Nebraska on three are unbelievable. Uh, that's all you ever need for your Nebraska coverage. So we are blessed to have them at on three. So, uh, but yeah, it's hard to, it's, you know, and there's, there's such good people, man. On that trip last year, that was literally the best road trip I've ever been on in terms of yeah. people and, and passion and everything else and environment uh, outstanding. So uh, it's hard to say bad things about them, especially with uh, Scott Farkas Frost gone. So uh, I like Michigan 38 to 10. I think they take the, uh, the foot off the pedal a little bit late in that game, but I don't know think they cover, but I think they win more than handily. Yeah. As I said before, I, I have 38, 14, uh, won't be quite as explosive a week on the point total for or with Michigan's points, just because I think Nebraska will probably play a little better than uh, Rutgers did in the second half of that game. So 38 uh, 14. I think Michigan will score a touchdown on a deep ball. It's my bold prediction for the week. Uh, be nice to see. But yeah, I mean, I, it's there's a little little less juice. Remember about in the offseason last year, people had circled the game between Michigan and Nebraska as like, oh, this might be a game that determines who gets fired between Jim Harbaugh and Scott Frost. And my, how, how things have changed since then. So um, yeah, it's. Uh, be a little less, little less juice to this one this weekend, but I think it. I, I see it being fairly routine, and hopefully Michigan just stays healthy too. Is the biggest thing at this point. But yeah, another dominant win for the Wolverines. And then this off season, this past off season, we heard ESPN analysts, some you know, I won't name names, I guess, but who said that Nebraska was going to win the West. And here they are with Mickey Joseph as their head coach coming in. We did talk about this coming into the year when we were looking at the schedule. And we were like, that's either a game that Nebraska's playing for everything, you know, at that point, or they're just dead. And they're pretty much dead. I mean, I know Mickey Joseph talking to Sean Callahan, he said it's just a real tough, you know, position to be in, but he's kind of managed the team and kept them up and done a good job from that respect. But there's only so much you can do. Um yeah in your three and six team at this point in the season. So, and yet, and yet there's still a path for them to win the big 10 West, right? <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> is, is there? I mean, I I'm not kidding. I, there probably is. They're, they're probably not so is. bad. Yeah. It's so crazy, right. but anyway, uh, they're just not very good. And, and I hope they get back on their feet. It's good for football. If uh, for college football, if Nebraska is good, in my opinion, uh, I got 49, 14, you know, it's pretty blowout. You know, I think Michigan's going to handle them. Uh, we'll see what happens. I also haven't won staff picks this year, which is actually more impressive than winning. Uh, some would say many are actually saying that. So there's some spin. Uh, <laughs> that's good. It's impressive to go this that's long a, and not win. So that's some Michigan State spin right there. <laughs> oh so <my> <laughs> exactly. yes, I said it. Um, offensive player of the game. I'm going to go with Donovan Edwards. I think we're seeing his role expand. We're seeing him more as a guy who they motion out of the backfield in play wide receiver or in the slot or just line up straight, straight up there. His touchdown catch was about of as good of a job as we've seen a Michigan receiver go up and get the ball this season. He's got those natural skills. Also, as Mike Hart was talking about on Wednesday, you know, they're running him more and they're seeing a lot of improvement with the way he's running the football, which I believe bodes well for the future of the backfield as well. But there's just so much you can do with this guy. And somebody asked us on our message board today, who's, Who's an X factor or what is an X factor if Michigan were to go down and beat Ohio State on November 26th? And, and the first guy that pops to my mind is Donovan Edwards. So I'm going to go with Donovan Edwards. He had a great month in November last year once he got healthy uh, in those last few games, including the Big Ten Championship. And uh, I think it's his time of year again. He's starting to step up. Yeah, I'm going to go with uh, 
I'll go with Blake Corum again. I think he's going to have a big game on about 18 carries before he gets to rest a little bit. And he will rest a little bit more, guys. They're going to split the carries a little bit more. But uh, I just think he's going to have a big day again, and he's always the safe bet, right? He is. I'm going to do it again. Bang my no. fist on the table. No, for Andre. I knew it. No. <laughs> it's time. It's that time. is some stubbornness. That's hey, it's that's my like favorite. Jim Harbaugh running the ball at the one over and over and over and over again. It <laughs> makes some people mad, but as long as makes you get me it fine, in, just get yeah. it in, baby. Yeah, they'll say it. <laughs> so Andrew, okay, I stick um, to it. Yeah, no, I respect it. I respect it. Um, defensive player of the game alluded to it before. This is another safe bet, but Mike Morris has been a guy who stepped up all season long. I see the tackles; the right tackle is especially weak. Um, and he's just kind of found a way. He's been the best pass rusher. He's been the best run stopper from the edge spot as well, and kind of that you know leader up front for those guys. So I'm going to go with Mike Morris. I'm going to take a risk here. I'm going to go with Yabi Oki. I think they're going to give okay. Morris some extra attention, and, and he's been quiet. Oki has. So I think it's time for him to get to the quarterback. I think this is the perfect time to do that and uh, go get him. Make me look good. Yeah. Um, I, where do I want to go? I'm going to go with Chris Jenkins. Uh, no reason. Just going with Chris Jenkins. He's been fantastic. Yeah. How much? Do, how much does he weigh now, Clay? Um, as of today, I don't know exactly, but yeah, he's up around two ninety, two ninety two. Yeah. He doesn't look that undersized anymore. No, yeah. and he's not playing like it either. He's been fantastic. I like that pick. Right. Yeah. No, he's been a he's been a sneaky. Uh, you know, one of the most valuable guys on that entire defense. Um. All right. Let's get into our picks for college football we got three games to pick in our segment called no man knows the future we don't know what's going to happen this weekend it's always crazy but we will try to predict it uh i'm obviously not very good at that but purdue at illinois uh illinois six and a half point favorite over under 45 um illinois looked like illinois i believe is tom crawford uh, who's on the podcast with john borton said over uh, a couple days ago when we were talking to him at the basketball game. And he's right um, against Michigan State losing that game at home. I mean, I don't really – I was looking at the West standings earlier. Like, you're right, Chris. I'm pretty sure, like, everybody's in play at this point. <laughs> except for um, Northwestern. Yeah, except Northwestern, who actually looked decent at times against Ohio mm-hmm. State last week and with the windy conditions. Um, I got Purdue. Um, I, you know, they're still playing for something, and I think that – Illinois is starting to come down a little bit, but I do think Illinois is still a solid, good team. I think Illinois is going to shorten the game by running all over Purdue, and I like Illinois to cover, uh, actually, uh, in a bounce-back game. I think they took Michigan State for granted because they were last place in the Big Ten East and just overlooked them. I'm going to go with Illinois. You know, Every time that Purdue under Jeff Brom has had a chance to kind of get one of those signature-type wins where they could, hey – God, you know, God willing, go play a game in Indianapolis at the end of the year. They kind of, they kind of crap themselves a bit. So uh, I liked, I, you know, last week was a bad look for Illinois, but uh, I'm going to go with, with them to bounce back and ultimately wind up representing the West somehow. I believe this is the earliest since I think 2010 that Alabama has been out of uh, national championship contention, which is insane because it's November 10th right now, this coming weekend will be, November 12th, and uh, it just shows how much success they've had. But Alabama at Ole Miss. Ole Miss is an 11.5-point underdog at home over under 65. A top 11 matchup without playoff implications, which is pretty crazy, although never know, uh, considering LSU, all that talk. But I'm going to go with Ole Miss to cover the 11.5 and, um, and, and be able to run the ball. Yeah, me too. And I think that they won't they won't cover. I think Alabama will win, but they won't cover. So I don't think uh, he's going to let him. I don't think Nick Saban's going to lose to Lane Kiffin. Yeah, I I like Ole Miss as well uh, to cover that number. I again, I'm with Chris. I think Alabama will win, but this is just not. It's just not the Alabama we're used to seeing. It's starting to kind of feel like they're similar to Clemson last year, where their star kind of fell a bit, even though they're in the SEC. And gosh, all it takes them is to win one more game for everyone to kind of see how they can sneak them back into the playoff when you talk to the national people. So, uh, but I'll go with Ole Miss, uh, but Bama gets back in the week column this week. Last game, TCU at Texas. 
This is a big one for playoff imp- implications. Texas seven and or seven now uh, point favorites over under sixty five at home. Um, Quinn Ewers is healthy. It's like one of the first times in the last six or seven weeks that TCU has played a starting quarterback. So they've been on an incredible run in that regard. <laughs> um, I will go with Texas to cover this. I think it's going to be in great environment. And I think, you know, when you look at it, it's like, okay, how would Michigan get in? TCU is undefeated, all this. And then you remember, you know, and it'll probably be after this weekend where, oh, yeah, well, they lost. They're pretty much done at this point. And there's going to be more of a chance for one of those one loss teams from, you know, more of a power conference like a like a Big Ten or SEC to get in. So I'm going to go with Texas. Yeah, I agree. I think they're going to win by about 10 points. I think the atmosphere gets them. And uh, I think I don't think Texas is great, but I don't think TCU is that great either. So and in that environment, I like TC or I like Texas to win and cover. I'm going to be the contrarian here and go with TCU only because one, it seems like, again, Texas is another school. Every time you have a chance to really turn the corner with one of those wins, another team that kind of fails to show up in that moment. And also, I'm starting to get the feeling that TCU is going to be like the opening round cannon fodder to Georgia. Like that's it seems like every year the Georgia or Alabama, their first game, they just blow the brakes off someone. Well, it happened for both of those teams last year, but um, yeah, TCU long winded today. Okay. There you have it. Those are our picks. That is our show for this week. Enjoy the game this weekend. Uh, for those going to the big house, hope to see you there and uh, make sure to head to the Wolverine.com for all your coverage. $10 gets you premium access over there until next football season, 2023. So take advantage of that right now, and we will see everyone next time.